Hello again, welcome to another edition of Crop Life Retail Week. Back in studio, I'm Eric Sulagoy from Crop Life and Crop Life Iron Magazines. Here today with Richard Jones, my partner in crime. Richard, welcome. Thank you. It's a beautiful day here in, in Willoughby. It's a little cloudy, but it's it's a nice fall weather here. It, it, it feels like it went from about 80 to about 50 in about two weeks. Yeah, so. and I know, I know I've seen the long range forecast for here in Ohio. It's supposed to be we're not going to get out of the 40s and 50s for the next week so uh, the leaves will be coming down i'm sure lots of harvesting going on i know there's lots of beans going out of the fields around my home but uh yeah but uh richard you know in the fall here we're, we're gearing up we have been gearing up for a lot of big things going on here at the company at crop life and one of the things of course we've been talking about i'm sure everybody knows is the pace executive form coming up here at the end of october so why don't you give a Little uh, little teaser to our audience about what's going to be going on in sure. Kansas City at the end of the month. I'm hoping the weather will be a little bit warmer in Kansas City than it is here, but maybe it's uh, we'll, we'll take it. But uh, uh, you know, you've been talking with a lot about the different segments of the program. We've been working hard to put together a, a great program. I think it's going to be a lot of uh, really interesting discussions. It's going to be an open forum in a lot of ways, but we're going to have some good panels and and presentations. But the one specific line I'm going to be working on is uh, kind of our third section of the program on, on the second day um, and really focused on the retailer of the future and how we're, we're building a roadmap for success for these guys, helping them uh, lay the groundwork for a, a profitable future for, for those folks. So uh, we're going to be talking about things like uh, tech-enabled data-driven agriculture. Uh, we're going to be talking about you know, the next generation of the grower customer for the retailers and and what they're going to what their capabilities and their interests and the demands that they're going to have for the retailer and the demands that they're getting for their customers um, what are the retailers going to need to be doing to to adapt to that and and help those grower customers uh, we're going to be talking about the interconnected food value chain and how all the little bits of information and how the technology is is connecting the different elements of that um, and then finally, we're going to be talking about how we can take all these different pieces, parts, and put them together to help us all pivot to a more profitable future uh, for retailers and for ag as a whole. So it's going to be a great discussion. I'm going to be doing a, a, a kind of an opening presentation for that session with uh, Doug Rott, who is uh, di Director of Digital Technology at Wilbur Ellis Company. So we have been having some discussions with him. Uh, it's going to be really interesting, a lot of fun, I think. Uh, really good discussions. Uh, and then we'll also have Asa Good, who's the Managing Director for the Center uh, for Food and Agriculture Business at Purdue, is going to be helping us moderate a panel during this session too. So a lot of really good stuff to talk about and uh, we're anxious to get down there and get going on this. Oh, very good. Well, since you mentioned, you gave me a good segue, you mentioned Doug Gaw from Wilbur Ellis. Uh, actually, a week ago now, I uh, held a webinar with three folks, Doug being one of them, also with Ben Sauter from uh, Frenchman Valley Co-op and Jeremy Wilson from Ag Gateway. And uh, we were talking about that topic you just discussed, the new generation of agriculture, the, the, uh, the next folks coming up in the marketplace. And one of the, one of the topics we focused on, of course, been a lot on the minds of folks attending shows this year, was uh, autonomous vehicles and technology adoption. So here's a little video clip. I'm, it's pretty long, but uh, you'll appreciate it. Uh, where these three gentlemen and myself were discussing the timeline or expected timeline for what uh, will happen with technology adoption and agriculture going forward over the next year or so. What kind of adoption curve and timeline do you predict will take place as a result of these new innovations? And why do you think this will be the case? And in that instance, I'm talking about will it be a slow, curve or a faster curve. So take it away. I think that the curve is going to get way faster as we start getting younger and younger kids involved. Um, what I've noticed uh, when we when we first went and uh, looked at Dot Raven's autonomous sprayer, my uh, I just stood back and watched my young guys grab the joystick or the iPad or whatever they were steering it with. And they were very, very comfortable doing that. As a matter of fact, they were, they were more comfortable with that than a steering wheel of a tractor. Um, it's very natural to them. I think, uh, I think the technology will, adoption will be way faster 
with this next group of kids uh, because this is this is something that they're used to, something that they grew up with. Uh, I I think that there are so many neat things yet to come. Um, agriculture, I think these kids will will suit it to themselves, uh, develop the the platforms and the hardware and equipments that best suits them that us with some gray hair can't even begin to understand yet. Yeah, it's interesting you said that because I know I'm thinking about some of those movies I used to laugh at back in the, I uh, used to watch them in the early 2000s where they were talking about the kids and they were saying, you know, my my goal when I graduate is to play video games for a living. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's funny that those, I mean, I used to laugh at that comment, but maybe it wasn't so funny in hindsight. So there's a, there's a far side comic. I love the far side where he has a, uh, you know, it's proud parents and it, can you save the, can you save the Quing $80,000 a year to, to start out $50,000 sign on bonus. And I mean, it's, it's here in a different sense, but it's here. All right. Well, thank you, Ben. Mr. Doug, your view on this. You know, I, I would agree with Ben in terms of the, uh, the pace of adoption. Um, one of the ways that I kind of view uh, kind of this new, new, this more modern uh, um, offering that ag technology is bringing. It's kind of two streams, right? You have what Ben just kind of described there in terms of um, operational efficiencies, right? So you've got that stream. So you've got automation, you've got robotics, you've got, you know, different, different ways in which the farmer can be more operationally efficient, which is something that they're truly passionate around, right? And, 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 and I think that they can embrace that. And then you have another, another stream, which is uh, the, uh, the ag technology that's helping folks and retailers like Wilbur Ellis become better service providers to the farming community, right? And so we kind of have two streams. And I, will, I would say though, Eric, like that, 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 that technology space that's bringing, that's allowing Wilbur Ellis to be better service providers. We've obviously learned a lot over the last 20 years on how to improve that because the last 20 years, we have not done that very successfully, right? And so some of these technologies are actually, I think are, are, are gonna be implemented and executed and deployed in our marketplace. And, and to Ben's point, I would agree, it's the adoption is gonna be, the, the adoption curve is gonna be uh, much quicker than it had been in the past. Um, and I think one way in which that will also accelerate the adoption is our ability to connect these together. So you have a, a, a in essence, like a data exchange that's going to occur to even provide an even much deeper solution to the farmer moving forward. Okay, Doug, I know just to, to put you on the spot a little bit, I know that Borellis has been working with Guardian Ag on the new aerial applicator, which would fall into the realm of technology advancement. Of course, um, you know you were talking about the the you know the, the timeline being sure. quicker. I mean, have, has has Wilbur Ellis in this partnership? Have you advanced your timeline for getting this into the market, or are you going to go on a little slower curve just to be cautious? No, we would. Um... I got to be honest with you, and I'll, and I'll speak on behalf of Wilbur Ellis, but uh, we're ready to go uh, with this technology. Um, and I believe Guardian is developing and has developed a technology that's ready to go. Um, what we're kind of running into in terms of any sort of speed bumps is all the regulatory things that come with it, right? So the FAA, and, and, and which is okay, right? Because that's the necessary thing. We got to make sure that this is safe. And that we've thought through this, but it is a uh, we're we're ready to go, right? Um, and uh, uh, um, and so it uh, it's an exciting opportunity for us, and uh, and so um, we're just we're just trying to be as patient as we can and make sure that we have all of our ducks in order, so when we do get the green light, that we can actually go out and provide the service to the farmer community. It's not as simple as just buying a hundred drones. No, sir. Is it? No. There is. There is so much more involved. That's yeah. that's the easy part. Yeah, there is a lot involved, and uh, um, but you know what? For us as a company, even though like 
we're a hundred year old company, right? That, and we like to consider us be, uh, we like to consider ourselves being very innovative over the last hundred years, right? But this has definitely opened up our eyes in terms of the complexity of innovation, right? And all the different, the different things that you need to consider as you start to uh, protect yourself from disruption, because that's essentially what we're doing with this agreement. We, we know disruption is gonna come within our own internal application division, right? Pilots are, are becoming, are getting older, the equipment is becoming older and more expensive, right? And so we have to look at different ways in which we can still service our customers in a meaningful and profitable way. Yeah, since, since you brought it up, Doug, I mean, again, Ben, did, you know, you, you, at, you at Frenchman Valley are, of course, using the, the automated spreader, the OmniPower by Raven. Did you have the same issues when it came to, like, some of the regulations that Doug's hinting at here or no? Our, not, not on that end. Um, when you put something in the air, it's, it's a completely different realm. We have, we have spray planes. We have, we have a couple drones that spray drones that we've done that with. And it's anytime you, you start dealing with a government agency like the FAA, it's, it's way, way different. Um, the, to, to run dot, we just had to have good connectivity. That was that was our limiting thing with it was just to be able to get the computer to connect to dot, um, and it would do what it was supposed to do with without any without any issue. But things in the air are a little bit different, aren't they, Doug? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Well, you know, for us as well as like so, and a little bit off topic, Eric, but like there's a public perception out there, right? And so. Uh, the market that we're going to roll this technology out is going to be in California. So we're also thinking about who do we have there to approach the pedestrian or the civilian as they walk by and they see this piece of equipment flying through the air because we need somebody to be able to engage with them and explain to them what is happening and educate them right in a positive manner. So it's a whole it's a whole thing, right? Yeah, no, that's a good that's a good point. Well, Jeremy, now you've heard from uh, two retailers who are talking about some of this, some of the hardware they're planning to put into the marketplace. Give us your views on the uh, the timeline and adoption curve. You know, I can't disagree with you know anything that they've said about the speed of adoption. And you know, I'm on here with two very progressive ag retailers and know them well and appreciate their innovation and, and how they're trying to be different. And and I really think one of the struggles that we have ahead of us is some of the maybe less progressive and the less innovative retailers and the run of the mill retailer that we're working with, I think the adoption is still going to be faster than what we've been through. I, I, and I know we have a, a group of workers coming in that's just clamoring at the bit for this technology because, you know, they were born with a smart device in one hand and, and a PlayStation in the other. And, and, you know, this just winds up and all this autonomy and all these things we look at, but the bigger question I have is, do we have mid-level, upper-level management that's ready to make the changes within the organization that it's going to take to be, to move forward with some of this new technology to really drive the true efficiencies that's going to come from it? So, yes, I think the adoption is going to be faster than what we've seen in the past, but I, I still think we're going to see it not at the pace of, that some would like to believe just because some of this technology is going to take some real operational differences within these organizations to be successful and, and to write a business plan to be profitable with them. I mean, it's going to take a different mindset and a different way to go to market. And, and I think you've got some very traditional, let's call it, you know, retailers, whether it's a co-op or, or otherwise, it doesn't matter, but it's just going to take a little different mindset. But overall, I, I think this, we're on a trajectory for this adoption to increase faster and I just think we've got to have some, there's just some logistical changes uh, and operational changes that's going to have to have to facilitate the speed of the adoption of the workers that you're bringing your organization want to see happen. So that's what these gentlemen had to say about technology adoption. And uh, again, Richard, at the end of that clip, of course, Jeremy Wilson made the point that, you know, the technology curve will probably be quick, but it'll depend on the personnel being in place to actually get the adoption into those uh, ag retailers in the first place. So, uh, and again, that dovetailed into a little later discussion in our webinar where we talked about 
um, you know, the workers that are in the workplace right now for ag retailers and the ones that they're expected to be having to recruit moving forward. So here is that clip. You're talking about the workers, uh, you know, the, the folks who are actually going to, the labor that's going to be helping out at the ag retail and grower level as these technology uh, adoptions happen more frequently as we move forward. I mean, what, you know, to you, Ben, first, I mean, what skills, what extra skill sets what extra mindsets are we going to need at ag retail that is actually going to make managing all these new technologies in, uh, in agriculture possible? First thing we're going to have to do is uh, reflect on what our qualities are as leaders in the industry and, cat and our, a lot of our preconceived notions about how the work gets done. We're going to have to completely reevaluate that as Nebraska's 1.9% unemployment, and there's just nobody looking for a job. And we've had ads for sprayer operators for a year that we've had no applicants for. So in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, how do I get somebody to do a, how do I get two shifts? Like my, my baby boomers, they, man, I appreciate the baby boomers. They They'd work a 16 hour day and be happy to do it. And life was great. And there's nothing wrong with the next generation. It's just their values are a lot different. They, they're going to enjoy life a little bit more than probably what my generation does. And there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So we've got to, I think we've kind of got to tailor the industry for the workforce that's coming up. Um, Kids don't want to drive big horsepower sprayers anymore. They're more comfortable sitting in the cab of a pickup. Like I've experienced running DOT off of an iPad or uh, the, the, the controller. Here's the controller that runs DOT. It looks just like a PlayStation controller. <laughs> so we've... We've got to we've got to rethink who we're going to hire to to put in these positions, um, and also be mindful of they want to have a life. They want to they want to go home at, at a decent time and not not be there when the sun comes up and spray for two more hours after the sun goes down. Um, but the the work demand is still on us to get done. Our customers still expect us to. To get the work done, so it's we got to get creative on our solutions, and the only thing I can come up with is trying to figure out to do two shifts. Or like Doug, I mean, he's they're going to have a fleet of five hundred Oliver tractors in the sky because that's what those Guardian drones remind me of is the front end of an Oliver tractor. That's going to be a different group of kids. That's or people that are flying those, and you can do fairly easily two shifts with those and it's a I don't we're not going to be able to do it the way that we have been doing it guys when I first started it was a hundred hour week and that was that was pretty common for six eight weeks you you worked a hundred hour week and man you felt good when you were done but uh people aren't willing to do that anymore so we've we've got to We've got to figure out how to do the autonomy and things like that to where we're getting more work done with less people. I don't, I don't see any way around it. I, I envision one person driving three or four sprayers. Uh, I call it mother duck and her ducklings. Um, you're always going to have to have a body in the field to identify water holes or trees down or things like that. The, the autonomous portion of it isn't there yet. It will get there at some point, but it's not there yet. So you'll still have to have one person controlling two or four sprayers. I think. Okay, Mr. Dunn. I I honestly I don't have a whole lot to, to add uh, above and beyond what Ben said on this one. Eric, I mean, he hit the nail on the head. The only the only the only the only area that I would kind of add to it is you know obviously you know we're inward thinking and and on a lot of these topics right but i think 
I think the farmer is going to have some trap challenges with this because what you're going to, what I think what you might experience on the farm is say you had that, 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 that hand, your, your number one person, right. That worked on your farm for 30 years. Well, some of these technologies might, they might move past that individual. Right. And so when you come to farm management, you may, you may be bringing in somebody at, that doesn't have quite that farming experience, but has has the the education and the ability to operate on maybe a more modern farm. So maybe that's way too far ahead, but I think that those are some of the challenges that our farming customers customers might experience, to be honest with you, as well. And we're already we're already experiencing that. We have such a presence on the West Coast, you know, Will Brellis does, and we're already starting to see some of that occur on some of our customers' farms where the grandson is now managing the grandfather, right? Which is a unique perspective, you know? Okay, Jeremy. Much like Doug, I don't have a whole lot to offer other than his example of the hitting the, the farm is very, very real. I mean, I have a 16 year old son right now and he couldn't be happier if I had an autonomous vehicle that I could set there that he could run and manage and you know yeah will he still get in that big piece of equipment and drive it yes he will but at the same breath you better not expect him there before nine ten o'clock in the morning and but at the same time if the YouTube's working and it's an autonomous vehicle he'll sit there till midnight so it it is just you know it's just a change and it's different and and, you know, I, I, I testified to the, to the FCC committees about connectivity. And I said, you know, connectivity is a bigger problem now. I don't need it to move data, but I've got to have it to get phones and, and tablets to connected to the web. Because even with auto steer alone, there's not enough entertainment in that job to keep this generation happy. They uh, still got to be on Snapchat or YouTube or something and and it just makes me cringe to think that i need to have a wireless connection and every piece of equipment to keep my driver entertained so that i can keep him employed or she employed and that's just going to be different and you know and i just i don't have the answer how I completely we're going to deal with it I, I think ben's comment on two shifts is spot on you know you've got my generation that yeah i'll just be as happy to be there at five in the morning and i'll get that equipment ready i'll get it rolling i'll get it out the door and then let this generation roll in at nine o'clock and get it to going down the field. So my question is, Ben, to you is what happens in 15 years when all of my generation's completely gone and now we're struggling to find someone that's there to have it ready for the next generation? You know, Jeremy, it was uh, everybody was probably freaked out about Generation X at some point. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Them worthless kids are never going to amount to anything. And yeah. I, we had to we had to figure it out, and I I think that this next generation will figure it out once once they start having kids and buying houses and growing some roots and and things like that. Then you get you get some responsibility. But man, I love the baby boomers. I've never had such a great appreciation of those guys until I got into this seat. <laughs> So that's what the gentleman had to say about the labor force. I know that uh, everybody there, particularly Ben Sauter, said he's really going to miss baby boomers as my generation retires from the marketplace. And uh, but, you know, I know the generations that are coming behind, I'm sure they will do just fine once uh, the marketplace figures out exactly what their motivational keys are to keep them in the marketplace. That's, it's it's something that just evolves over time in, in every industry and in every market that is the technology changes. Those of us who've been doing it for a long time have to adapt. Uh, we got to learn new, new, new skills, but then the folks coming up behind us are a lot of times really in tune with those skills already. And so how do we integrate those, get those folks more engaged and, and more involved in, in helping us move forward? Yeah. And I know that, you know, we're not bringing up one more time, the Pace Executive Forum, one of the things we're going to do there is on the first day, I believe, towards the end of the day, Richard, we're going to be doing a roundtable discussion. And of course, uh, you know, technology, supply chain, and most likely labor are going to be things that will be discussed. So again, the uh, Pace Executive Forum won't be just people sitting, listening to folks present to them on the stage. We're actually going to have a little interactivity going on 
with this roundtable discussion on that first day in the afternoon. We've got experts up there with sharing ideas, but everybody is part of that conversation. That's right. So if again, if you if you love to take part in uh, sort of this sort of uh, you know give and take with the folks around you, you will have your opportunity to paste the executive form. So we'd encourage you to check out the website for yourself. Sure, absolutely. All right. Well, Richard, we will end this video on the note like we okay. always do. Time for fun with numbers. Hopefully not like we always do. Oh, well. Sometimes I might get it right. Yes, well, this one, this week, I got to admit, I, I was surprised when I saw how big this actual number was, but that's what intrigued me. So okay. hopefully you, our viewers, will find it as intriguing. So Richard, your number, okay. one trillion trillion with a T. Okay. One trillion dollars. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. So does one trillion dollars represent A, the increase in net farmer in assets since 2012? Is it B, the increase in farm equipment costs since 2010? Is it C, the increase in ag export values since 2018? Or is it D, the amount I expect to spend on my sums Rubik's Cube habit before he turns 20. <laughs> That's a big budget for Rubik's Cubes. <laughs> Probably be in the hundreds, when but I, I don't think of trillions. When I was a kid, we had one and we liked it. <laughs> um, there are many more of these days, trust me. <laughs> I'm going to say B. Farm equipment. No, I am sorry, Rich. I'm glad we didn't end the streak there. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, actually, the one trillion, it, the correct answer is A. It's the increase in net farmer assets in 2012. That's good news. Um, yeah, you mentioned earlier uh, Asa Good from Purdue, and this was a Purdue study that said that uh, $1 trillion is the increase in net farmer equity since 2012 and it's projected in 2022 this year to hit 3.15 trillion dollars wow. so that's up from a little over 2 trillion 10 years ago man okay so there you go big number big number so again everyone hope you uh, enjoyed this video and uh, check out the pace executive form website and we'll hopefully look forward to seeing a lot of you in Kansas City at the end of the month. Absolutely. But on behalf of myself and Richard Jones, thanks for joining us this week. We'll see you again soon. If you have questions or comments about today's episode of Retail Week, contact us by email or Twitter or type your message in the comment section below. Your feedback is important to us. We will try our best to address your thoughts in next week's episode and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel.